A five-member medical team from Scripps Health traveled to Nepal. They treated more than 2,200 patients in a dozen or so remote villages and survived a second massive earthquake in the region. My guests, Scripps nurses Deborah McQuellen and Jan Zachary were part of the team. And Deborah, your Scripps team actually worked with the International Medical Corps. How many patients did you see each day and what kind of injuries did you treat? We saw anywhere between maybe 60 to more, more specifically about 200 patients at uh, some of the villages. Um, That's each day. Each day, depending mm -hmm. on how long we would run clinic in each of the villages that we that we visited. Um, the injuries kind of spanned along the continuum from our first villages where we saw more traumatic injuries from the earthquake itself, lacerations, people who had been hit by stones, fractures, things of that nature. And as the weeks wore on, we still saw some of those, specifically from the rebuilding efforts, but we also started to see some more infections and primary care problems because the patients hadn't been seen by anybody during that time. In a couple of weeks. Right. And, and, and Jeanne, do you have any specific cases of people you saw that sort of stand out for you? I think there was one elderly gentleman who had a deep uh, infected laceration and when we had arrived at the clinic he wasn't there and later in the day he came and he needed significant treatment with antibiotic IV therapy as well as debriding the wound and when the physician asked him well what took you away from not coming here earlier in the day his response was, well, my animals, I, I needed to, and he pointed up to a, a mountain that he had traveled to for four hours to care for his buffalo and said, my animals are far more important than any injury that I have. Anna, uh, what about you, Deborah? Does any case stand out for you? In one of the villages that we were in called Guayachek, there was a young man, about 36 years old, who had had a, a double valve, heart valve replacement in the past couple of years, and that requires lifelong medication. Um, since he'd returned back to his village, he was running out of his meds, and he really had a discussion with us about making the choice of trekking for maybe three or four days and not knowing if he would get to the pharmacy because of the trails being out by landslide, or staying and helping his family rebuild his home and ensuring their safety. Um, so that was very heart-wrenching to us, of he course. He made the trek and he survived? He did, he did not make the trek. We were, we were able to coordinate uh, a pharmacy drop for him that next day in the helicopter that came to pick us up to take us to the next village. And that was really very heartening for us as a medical team, as well as very important for him in his survival. Now, you were both there when that second 7.3 magnitude earthquake struck. Uh, Jan, let me ask you this. How did it impact the villages and your ability to uh, continue your mission there and treat people? Well, the, villages, the village people are so tired of the aftershocks, and there's such terror in their faces and their voices when there's an aftershock, but certainly when the actual quake happened. We heard screams throughout the villages. We saw dust from landslides and work that people had done on their homes, the stones began to crumble. So it was really evident that uh, we would not be able to helicopter out that day, but we would stay in the village and provide more support. Now, uh, you visited more than 13 villages uh, while you were in Nepal. Uh, Deborah, how did the people of Nepal receive you? You know, the people of Nepal are amongst the most resilient and, and generous of spirit of any people I've ever met anywhere in the world. And I brought an example of, of some of the gifts that we um, were presented with. And these are typical prayer shawls from Nepal. And we receive these from families and from hosts um, in, in recognition and in appreciation for our efforts for them there. So even though they were suffering even this, this through great their own devastation. ordeal with hundreds of earthquakes and aftershocks afterwards continuing in Nepal, um, it's also heading into monsoons. Uh, Jan, what sort of aid do they still need there? They're going to need long-term aid for many years to come, but from a short-term standpoint, the monsoon season is just weeks away, and most of the folks have had their seeds and grains that they have had under their homes buried, and they don't have access to food. So all of the international aid organizations are really working very fast and very hard to get enough adequate food and shelter for folks during a time of monsoons. They're still in tarps, and those tarps aren't going to be able to sustain the powerful rains that are coming their way. And Deborah, we have to end on this, but after seeing these earthquakes in the aftermaths, do you think San Diego was prepared for a big earthquake? 
I think we are prepared to an extent. What I don't think we're prepared for is the level of destruction and interruption in our basic infrastructures. I don't think we all recognize how difficult it's going to be for transportation to get the type of shelter and food and water that we may need during that acute period. And it's something that we all need to really look at more stringently in our own homes. All right, Deborah McQuellen and registered nurse Jan Zachary, thank you both so much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Peggy.